Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Monash Science Alumni Webinars, the first one for 2023. Um, my name is Udi Wijewadana. I am the Alumni Engagement Manager for the Faculty of Science. Um, so today's session is uh, presented by the School of Maths. And the format of the session is a 30 minute presentation followed by about a 20 minute or so Q&A session. So uh, if you've got any questions, please do put it in the Q&A section uh, and not in the chat section. All right, uh, before we start, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of our land and pay respects to the elders, past and present. So um, our moderator for this evening is Professor Kais Hamza, and he is the Deputy Head of School for the School of Mathematics, and his area of research is in stochastic systems. So Kais, I'll hand over the session to you now. Thank you, Udi, and welcome nice. everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here for this first alumni webinar. And uh, so I'll just give you a very brief uh, overview of the School of Mathematics before introducing the speaker today. Um, Associate Professor Andrea Colavecchio. So the School of Maths is a thriving school with uh, about 60 academic and research staff. Um, we have about 120 PhD and master's students. Um, our undergraduate enrollment is much bigger than that. Of course, we have over 10,000 enrollments each year across uh, 50, uh, more than 50 undergraduate units um that are offered in mathematics engineering and computer science we have uh, a broad run, range of uh, research strength that go from uh, um i looked it up uh, unfortunately we missed the z we go from a to t from algebra to topology we don't go all the way to the z but things like algebra analysis and geometry computational mathematics graph theory and of course probability which is one of uh, the topics uh, of uh, today. Um, uh, Andrea is uh, currently or has been a, a research director in the school. Um, he's done it for um, about four years. He's uh, currently, he's, he, he did step down from that position to take on a bigger role um, in the Data Futures, in the Monash Data Futures Institute as a research director there. Um, going back, um, Andrea uh, did his PhD at Purdue University in 2000, uh, um, finished, completed it in 2004. It was a PhD in statistics. After that, he had uh, a number of postdoc positions in Italy and Germany, and then um, was assistant professor at the Kapuskari University in Venice uh, in 2006, from 2006. Um, and then in 2012, uh, Andrea joined us um, initially as a, as a junior member of the staff, and then, of course, uh, to now where he is a, a really um, um, a central senior member in, 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 in the school and beyond being a research director uh, at the Monash Data Futures Institute. His research is quite broad. It's at the intersection of uh, probability, analysis, and mathematical physics. And he is a world expert in reinforced processes. Um, today, he'll talk about um, some of these things, including um, game theory, which he is rapidly becoming a world expert as well. Um, that's all I will say today. So over to you, Andrea. And thank you. Thank you, guys, for the nice introduction. And thank you, Udi, for organizing this. Um, before I start my talk, though, I would like to, to, to say a few words about the other affiliation that I have, which is so the Monash of the Future Institute. I, ju I just started the, my new role, as guys, you say, a few months ago, a couple of months ago. And I have the privilege of being part of an excellent team. Um, so we have Professor Joanna uh, Budstone. Uh, we have Bern, Chris, Derek, Jeff, 
and uh, Dixon, Claudia, VJ, Georgia, Brownen. Um, it's 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 a very nice group, and we also have a scholarship PhD um, that uh, that are affiliated to our institute. Our goal is AI and data science for good, and uh, if I could summarize in few items, health science, sustainable, sustainable development and governance and policy, and they align to the pillars of our institution here in Monash. The institute is huge, has more than 500 affiliates, and goes all around the faculties. Um, we have affiliated researchers from all the faculties of Monash. Uh, our goal is to nurture, coordinate capability, growth of collaboration between different groups in different schools, different faculties, coordinate bids and um, grants. And of course, we also have our own grant, um, seed grants, internal grants for researchers in Monash that are interested in data science, AI, um, we have external network with other institutions, collaborations, and also with a, uh, industry partner uh, uh, with um, foundations. So to, to mention one, the, the Paul Ramsey Foundation, we are open to have collaboration with further collaboration with external partners. And I say more about it at the end of my talk. Finally, I would like also to advertise, I'm not sure this is the right venue for that, but there is a sequence of seminars called the Monash Prato Dialogue, and they are very nice. Give it, please take your time to, to browse the website when, if you can, when you can. And this takes us to our talk. Uh, a small so that the, the when I created these slides, I think I, I I should say these are a bunch of random of random topics of random games, and I I worked on this with many co-authors, and we started very recently. We, we we start working on this three years ago, and few projects, at least four or five, with different set of co-authors, but everything started with. Uh, out of curiosity and trying to have fun with a specific model. And I must, a small disclaimer, I'm not a game theorist. I, I what my expertise in this, all this is comes from the world random and I, I stick with it. It's, it's, it's what interests me. Anything that has randomness, somehow I, I try to, to put my, try to, to, to study. And um, what, but nevertheless, we're talking about games and I need to give an introduction to what games are. And a good narrative is a set of circumstances that as a, a result dependent on the actions of two or more decision makers. I, 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 would, I would summarize this a bit differently. You have a set of players, they take a decision. The decision are strategies. And there is a consequence of their decision, which we call payoff. If we think of a game, I personally think of this game. But today we are not going to talk about this class of games. I have to be more precise on what we have in mind. Of course, we could, in principle, include chess in our, in our um, study, in our analysis. But we have to sacrifice a bit few assumptions, we need to put a few assumptions there. And um, what I could, in order to, to introduce the class of games that we consider, I think the best way to start is with an example. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any time with a question in the QA uh, section, uh, do not hesitate. And I think the most popular way, the best way to summarize the assumptions that we're going to make is to, to, to have in mind that uh, this, this example would, would do is you have two uh, criminals. They acted together. They, 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 they made something together. And, and 
they uh, they have been caught and put in different rooms and ask the same question separately. They cannot interact. And they have only two options. Either they can, co they can confess or, or they just stay silent. They have to take the decision separately, but the outcome depends on both, on both decisions, on both strategies. If both of them confess, they stay five years in jail. If one of them does, confess and the other does not, well, the sincere person will get out of jail immediately. The other one is punished a lot, 20 years. If both of them stay silent, well, one year each. The questions that we're going to address today is, what is the optimal choice? And I should be honest on what I mean by optimal. What is the stable choice? If they both are in this strategy profile, for example, in this case, you could think if they both stay silent, is it a stable? Is it an equilibrium? Is it optimal in this sense? Well, I, I can see that this person here compares this one year with this, zero. He prefers zero. He doesn't want to spend any time there if we assume that he's greedy. And we are going to assume that. The same is for this other person, by the way. So if each of them separately could deviate from that option, and they do, that is not stable. Um, on the other hand, uh, I should remove this. Let me delete this, otherwise it's messy. If I look at what looks less optimal here, but indeed it is, um, look at these five years. I should not compare this to the, this player, prisoner A, has only two options here. Yeah. He, can, he can compare this with this, what is below. He doesn't want to change. And the same is here for prisoner B, he can only, if given that the other prison, the prisoner stays where he is, doesn't change his strategy, so we allow one of them at a the time to change, he has to compare this with the 20 years. No good. So this is a stable equilibrium. Let me summarize. We have a set of player, set of actions, we have payoff. In this case, the payoff are negative. Um, what we want to do is to analyze what are what is the set of equilibria, and by equilibria, I mean something stable in the sense that I described. Now we could analyze this game by game, but there is a problem. There are infinitely many games. Analysis of a given game is is a bit. Is a bit uh, a lot of work if the game is big enough. By big enough, I mean you have a lot of players or a lot of actions. So, so what we can do in order to analyze a typical uh, scenario, um, what we thought of what is is done usually in physics, uh, in economics, is okay. Let's analyze a random game something chosen uniform at random maybe, or a little bit less uniform, but still at random. And so randomness could also come from the fact that you do not really know the payoff a priori. There could be some perturbation there. It's a very natural concept, if you think. So those numbers that we saw, we're going to take them randomly and independent of each other. Large number of players. We need large improbability for a reason. We need to somehow uh, neglect the randomness and try to have an answer that is asymptotically deterministic. Is what we do with a strong law of large numbers, with what we do in many terms. With small number of players, we could run our analysis directly. So large n is the difficult part. We need two actions and 
we are trying to overcome that, but it's it's. I'm going to explain to you why we allow for the moment just two actions per player. Um, the oh, outline of the talk goes like this: once I introduce these games, and I'm almost done with that. Uh, there was a striking connection with moguls that were already there in mathematical physics. I must add those in combinatorics, in graph theory. And the final part of the talk will depend on how much time do we have. Uh, and we'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the concept of mixed Nash equilibria, mixed equilibria, and try to, uh, I'll tell you a, another story a little bit again and why we look at mixed nation. But first, I gave a small example. It's not enough. I need to represent the game formally because soon we're going to deal with some formal object here. And the talk should be fairly light in terms of mathematics, formulas included, but uh, there is still something must be done a bit rigorously. And we need to, to represent the game properly. Player one, player two, with player three becomes already more difficult to represent in this way. This is the extended form. Um, if the actions I'm going, if as everybody has two actions, I'm just going to label them zero, one, zero, one, and so forth. This eight here is, is $8 if, or $8,000, $8 million if both players um, play action zero, both of them action zero, but this is what player one earns. This is what player two earns. I marked in red what is the equilibrium game. It's not the highest possible payoff, but it's the stable one because two is compared to zero, two is better. These two is compared to this zero. So the red one is the stable equilibrium. It's a bit tedious to write the game in these terms. And also it's a bit, uh, not, not only that, when I increase the, the number of players, it's a bit impossible to write the game in this term. Uh, so we need to find a way, a more efficient way. Besides, I'm just making an assumption that is the usual assumption in economics that these players are very rational and very greedy. By the dollar, they would they would prefer to stay to move. If it, even for one cent, they would prefer to move. And if there is a tie, they don't move. They don't care if the, you can assume that if they are also a bit lazy, if they don't move, if numbers coincide. Um, I don't need to carry all these numbers. What I need to know is the preferences. I need to know that two is larger than zero. If it was instead of zero was one, the result would be the same. If I change this zero into one, this would still be an equilibrium. So I do not really care about the payoff. What I care is how I rank them. And um, I'll go back to the second item there. And this is what, uh, what I want to do. Um, let me put the, yeah, yes. This was the game. Instead of representing it with the numbers, I orient, I, first of all, action zero, action zero is this one, right? You see that the second player would move in this direction. So there is a natural flow towards this action where is one, uh, one, zero. Um, I made it wrong. This is, uh, I, I should have swapped. The, think of this as second player and this as player one. My apologies for that. Now the order reflects what is going on. And the same is here. From these eight, I would like to go in this direction because player two prefers to go to change, to change this action in this action, and this is what you have to do. And so forth. 
What I need is to know the preferences and a square will do in this particular case. But with, is, I mean, nothing that interesting because it's just a square and few numbers there. But already with three, it saves a lot of time and encodes anything that we need to know to realize what the Nash equilibrium is. Here, I took the freedom of um, uh, simulating uh, a game with three players already. So I embedded in a cube where the strategies are encoded by what you have there. And instead of the payoff, I do have the orientation. The payoff were all independent, same experiment. What we say in probability is the same distribution. Um, and I'm allowing ties here. So this blue edge is just a tie, the same payoff of one side and the other for that particular player. Um, notice that if we start the game here, these you, you and let's let's do this. Let's choose a player at random and ask him, would you like to change? If we choose this player, that is. Player two, yes, he would like to change. He would like to move. He would like to follow the flow here and move up. And the same is for this other player. If he's asked to move, you ask to one player at a time. So suppose you are here. Now, if he's asked to, if you pick a player at random, okay. If you, if it happens that this player is this guy, it goes in this direction, yes. And you keep going and notice. Once you are here, no matter which player you ask, they will not change. It's an equilibrium. Those two orange points are equilibrium. And this is encoded by the fact that they are incident to either um, edges that are oriented towards them, so no way out. They don't want to go against the direction there, or the the, the fact that the edges are unoriented and they are lazy. They don't want to move unless there is a larger payoff. Again, I marked with the same example, I marked what you can reach using this. This adjustment, you pick a player at random among the three here, and you, you just ask, would you like to move? If it is no use, it, if if it is not convenient, it stays where it is. If it is convenient, that player will move. But what can he reach? That's the question. This is what is accessible uh, with these dynamics that we call best response dynamic. You ask, you want to move, and if there is something better in the horizon, they do move. When they reach an equilibrium, they don't. Or if they are trapped in a loop, they don't. They cannot escape from that. So it's not guaranteed that this process that I just described, this adjustment in time, leads to a Nash equilibrium. They could be trapped, and I'll show you how. So first, I would like to analyze this set of objects of, of strategies that are accessible from your starting point, assuming that your starting point is 0, 0, 0, and there is nothing special about this. I could have started somewhere else. But I need to fix a set of strategies that I start with. And here is the interesting thing. There is a connection that we established between this and a famous model in mathematical physics that is called percolation, which is very easy to state but very difficult to study. On the other hand, luck somehow was on our side and there were results that we could use. On, on the other hand, we also discovered that different results in mathematical economics and in graph theory percolation in particular were available in the years, were the same results and they were not aware of each other work. So we connected two different um, you want to different fields. And that was fun. I still think that was the major part of this work. So 
the connection, what is the connection? What is, we have to start to say, what is the percolation itself? And here I prefer, in advance, I draw this cube here, and I'll do the following experiment. Initially, you have the whole cube, and then you have this coin that you can see on the left, badly written, badly, badly drawn. And you say, okay, let's, for each edge, I flip this coin. And this coin shows head with probability P and tail otherwise. And I flip it independently for each of the edge. If it shows head, I keep the edge. So I start with this edge one, maybe is this one. I flip the coin, shows head, I keep it. No, uh, it shows tail. I want to stick with the example before. It shows tail, I remove it. I do the same with the same coin, but with another independent experiment with this edge here. It shows head, I keep it. I do it here now, and it shows tail. Unfortunately, I need to delete you. And I keep going for each of the edges. Now, of course, you understand that what I'm doing is just to get exactly the graph that I ever do, but you can think of this as an outcome of a random experiment. Famous one, it's very, it's used in many contexts. And what we establish is that what you can reach on the left on that oriented, randomly oriented, if you use random payoff cube, is exactly this graph, orange graph here, which is once you perform the percolation, you have this random outcome. What is connected with them? They are the same in many ways. So there is a connection between these and the percolation. The proof of this is non-trivial, even though it's natural once you think about it, because the randomness implies when you have two actions that for each of these uh, edges here, you flip an independent coin if you want to establish if, if they are in one direction, the other, or an object. Now, in this, I should say, what are the parameters? Our P here is one minus alpha over two, where alpha is inherited from the game. Alpha is the probability to have ties in the payoff, in two different payoffs. Notice that the payoffs are the same type of experiment, independent from each other. So the probability of two random variables are equal to each other. If the randomness comes from a uniform distribution, in the interval, you have alpha equal to zero. So it's allowed. Alpha equal to one is boring. So these emphasize that the orange here has the same distribution, a bit more is equivalent to the orange that the other experiment. These are two different experiments. One, the left one is the gain, the right one is the percolation. It's what the physicist looks at. But this doesn't answer our question, which I did not really formulate, by the way. So what we're interested in. How many PNEs? By PNE, I mean pure Nash equilibrium. The equilibrium I mentioned before. This is question one. Two, how to find them? Uh, I partially answered this question. In this context, what I'm going to do is to adjust with the best response dynamic. I ask to one player at the time, ask them if they want to deviate from where they are and keep going until I reach either an equilibrium or something annoying, something else. The something else is actually this, is a trap. So a p &E is something nice. We are happy if we reach a p &E, a pure Nash equilibrium. It's, it's a vertex where everything from the outside would like to go in that direction, or there are ties. A trap is a, is a cycle where all the edges outside this cycle point in that direction or are tied, but inside the cycle, you don't decide where to stabilize. These are interesting per se, but it's not what we want at this stage. I actually 
have nothing against them, but if we are looking for an equilibrium, they prevent us to reach an equilibrium because the adjustment process that I told you before, once they enter such a graph, cannot lead. So they prevent us from finding Nash equilibrium if they exist. Now, in order to use the percolation tools, what we have to do, we cannot really do it right away because the connection is between what is accessible and the percolation. I don't read directly pure Nash equilibrium there. But the nice thing is that there is a trick. The trick is this is the Nash equilibrium, invert the direction of the arrows. What we do is if an arrow goes, if an edge is oriented in one direction, just change it in the opposite direction. If it is unoriented, keep it as it is. The randomness is the same. It's the same type of experiment. It doesn't affect the experiment. But something interesting happens. You see, if you start from here, if this was the origin, I, I did in three dimension, but you can work in a dimension here, yeah? you cannot reach this object because all the arrows point outside. No, or they are uh, unoriented. So non, you cannot travel unoriented edges. So what I'm saying is that you cannot reach that is inaccessible. And the same is for the traps. If the starting point is somewhere else, you cannot reach them. Once you do this surgery of changing the direction of the arrows, keeping the unoriented ones as such. Um, so this is the trick. The experiment is the same. You just had change it in the, in the opposite. The opposite has the same distribution what you had before. And now it's spin because if you know what is accessible, if you know the geometry of what is accessible, you know what is not accessible. And that is where you have to look for Nash equilibrium. Now, I spent some time here uh, to visual, try to visualize this. Um, and I know the geometry, I know how to describe it in um, some kind of abstract nonsensical terms. Um, this, this is the way we, we, we wrote the paper. We actually used uh, the description of the job, uh, but for a talk is not suitable. And the only way I could visualize this is really, um, uh, this is a summary. The only way I could visualize this is this. Now, this is, if you look at a large number of, uh, of players, and it's very large, it's not three-dimensional object is much larger. It's called hypercube. You cannot really visualize it. And when you perform the percolation, what you do is you remove some edges and make something disconnected from your starting. So what I see, the way I see it, these are what you remove. It's the way I see it. And the analysis that has been carried very nicely by McDermott, Scott, and Witters in 2021, exactly when we started our work. In fact, then Scott became a co-author in, uh, in a different project that I'm going to summarize soon. Um, what they came up is exactly the tool that we needed. Uh, it came exactly at the moment we asked the question, so we didn't waste any time. Otherwise, we, we should have worked those tools by ourselves, and there's a lot of work, interesting work. What, what would they say? is the maximum size of these holes that you see is where you have to look for traps and Nash equilibria is exactly in those holes is what you cannot access is this magic number so uh, for alpha equal to zero the maximum size of the holes is one you have one vertex isolated from the rest which is exactly the pure Nash equilibrium for alpha larger size two vertices and the distribution of the holes, how they distribute in this hypercube of this 
piece of cheese here. And so for alpha equal to zero, uh, it was already proved by uh, Erdos and Spencer for the percolation and Powell and Stanford for uh, the, and Scarsini and uh, Reynolds for the game theory apart for the PE, &E, that the number of pure Nash equilibria or the number of holes follow the so-called Poisson distribution. In other words, the probability to have no pure Nash equilibria is approximately 0 0.36. And this is exactly also the probability to have exactly one Nash equilibria. This is for the case alpha equal to zero. If you have payoff that are uniformly distributed on, on the interval or normally distributed or exponentially distributed, anything, you name it, those distributions that do not allow you to have a tie. But if ties are allowed, things change drastically. The number of Nash equilibria grows dramatically, grows geometrically. You have plenty of that. So the first question, if alpha is positive, any number between zero and one, strictly larger than one, you have a lot of Nash equilibria. And this is the good news. So it only it is only left to prove that you can reach them, you can find them. And this slide wasn't supposed to be here in the sense that I wanted to remove it, but then I thought that few people in the audience know a little bit more about probability just for the sake of these best response dynamics is a simple random walk on the oriented hypercube. And it has interest for probabilists per se, and this is what I insist. But let's go back to our question. So can we find them? We have plenty of them. We have a lot of Nash equilibrium. Where are they? How they're scattered in the game? And how can I reach them? These are the questions. So for alpha between zero and one half, we have plenty of Nash equilibrium and they are all reachable. All of them are inside that cluster of strategy that we can reach from our starting point. This happens with very, very high probability. And when I say high probability, I mean that the opposite happens with probability practically zero or something decreasing to zero extremely fast when n grows. The larger n, the more likely what I say is true. Not only that, but the likelihood goes to one very quickly. If alpha is larger than one half, you have more Nash equilibria, but they are, some of them are lost. You cannot reach from where you started. And I repeat that when you start, as long as does not depend on the payoff, plays no role in what I say. It's kind of magic. And if alpha is small enough, the best, not only they are reachable, the best response dynamics will find them. This was the original paper. The first paper I wrote with Marcus Carcini, Ben Amiet, and Zewan Zon. Ben and Zewan are my PhD student. Marco was my supervisor when I was honors student a long time ago. And it was fun to work together on that. And it was fun to work more. And this is the only real formula we have. I could not resist to include it in the slides. So forgive me, but um, I translate it in this way. There is the last result recently. What we proved is that for any alpha larger than zero, the best response dynamic will find an Nash equilibrium with a very high probability. This formula here, I left it because it tells you much more. For those of you who know the borel cantelli lemma, it tells you that for all large n, you'll find an Nash equilibrium. But this is not, uh, it's not, doesn't really matter. It's an affirmative answer to the last item. It's good news for any alpha larger than zero. For alpha equal to zero, we also prove that if the Nash equilibrium exists, the best response dynamics will find it. So this natural object that you ask to each player one at a time to deviate or just to choose to move or not, and they do it if they see any convenience, works you find the Nash equilibrium. Bad news. Um, after this 
good news, some bad ones. If we change the model and we 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 go back to, for example, two players and many actions instead, nobody will guarantee this. Uh, in some cases, in some other model, so what we analyze so far is n players, two actions, large set of players, small set of actions for each other. But if we deviate from these, we analyze, we go back to, for example, two players and many, many actions, Nash equilibrium might not be there, pure Nash equilibrium. But the other good news, I like to oscillate between the two, is that mixed Nash equilibrium. In this case, the best strategy for this particular example here is to, for each player, not to choose one action, but to flip a fair coin to decide the action. So instead of choosing the action in per se, you randomize. If each of them choose a fair independent coin, that's the best strategy. Nobody wants to deviate from that. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but those mixed Nash equilibria have the property that exist all the time in a reasonable scenario, finite games. By finite game, I mean either a finite number of players or actions, both of them. You cannot see both finite number of players, both finite number of actions. Um, I, 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 what we did recently with Gabor Lugosi, uh, Rui, and uh, Adrian Beta is to prove that for two players uh, and 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 action, you 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 can find the mixed Nash equilibria in a polynomial time. In this, in the following sense, consider a random with random payoff of a certain type, win-lose scenario. And there is an algorithm that has expected time of converging, the expected convergence time to a mixed Nash equilibria that is polynomial. This is a work in progress, so it's still, we are still checking, but we are fairly confident. And before I finish, and I'm running really out of time. I would like, so I mentioned at the beginning that um, both in the School of Math and, and, and Monash Data Futures Institute, we are really keen to work with external partners. And this is an event that I organized last year, and I'm reorganizing this year together with Fiona, with uh, Fiona Brussar, Kais, Amsa, Tim Garoni. Uh, we, we are going to organize this workshop that is completely free and puts together two different worlds and it's it's a lot of fun if you have any project or, or you know someone that could be interested just drop me an email and my email is this one so yeah Udi can also if you if you have any if you want to contact me if you don't have my email you cannot find it ask to Udi and she will provide it and thank you I'll I'll be happy to answer your questions if Thank you, Andrea. That was really interesting. Uh, okay, so um, please do ask your questions. If you have uh, questions, please write them in the Q and A. Um, while we wait for questions, maybe if you can tell us a little. I know that you touched a little bit on 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 that on on the. Uh, many actions that this is work in progress and that sounds like really interesting and maybe a little bit hard but can you tell us a little bit more about it so you said that you know you basically have two situations where you have either um, many players and two actions or or two players and many actions uh, i guess what would happen if uh, you had Many players and many actions, you know, <laughs> and and you make you know made that oh, big oh. n go to infinity in some way. So for alpha equal to zero, we know exactly what happens. Uh, the number of Nash equilibria is still um, Poisson uh, one with parameter one. So th those probability stays the same if you alpha if alpha is equal to zero. So for the number of Nash equilibria we set. For uh, also for alpha larger than zero, you can prove that the number of the equilibrium is quite 
big growth geometrically, but you do not, geometrically in what though, I think in the multiplication of the two numbers where the two numbers is the number of players and the number of action, um, if, or a combination of the two, I think uh, that should be the product. And uh, the, the, these are these asymptotic results, right? Um, yeah, but they are sharp in the sense that uh, um, the com it's asymptotical, but also for small n, they would hold because they are very concentrated, is what we say. So they, they are asymptotical result, but we provide the, the rate of convergence. So for if n is 10, 15, you would say ah, and it's not big enough. Our result, the rate of convergence, the estimate, we say which error you make. What is the probability that that does not hold? That allows you to say that if you plug even smaller n compared to the use what we could think, the probabilities are quite generous on our side. It's for, for, how, for, for how many action is that? So this is for n player two actions is what I'm saying. N player yeah. more actions, um, you uh, so the, you cannot use the percolation as it is. You need to change the percolation because it's not independent percolation anymore. There is some dependence in some subgraph. And it's quite interesting because uh, the percolation model itself is a bit arbitrary if you think that you, you, you have a lot of this independence. In any case, the dependence is so weak that we expect to have the same type of results. Uh, for two players and, and actions, actually it's completely different. You are not, you, you, you still, uh, so for alpha equal to zero and a large number of, of actions, you still have a person one approximation. Someone else proved that. Uh, alpha equal to zero has been in the literature for a while. Uh, oh, how to find the Nash equilibrium is interesting. Uh, we wrote, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's the best response dynamics we proved you were also part of it for this particular <laughs> is, is, uh, is uh, does not does not uh, does not uh, converge. Whereas another process is more ideal, but you didn't mean to ask that case most probably. No, yeah. no, I, I, I was talking about large number of actions, a large number of players. Yeah. That, and, uh, that one is is complicated because of the of the dependence that you are the dependence uh, ruin all the result in percolation that are there, but gives us the opportunity to study a new type of percolation. And I think uh, is what when I when I talk to physicists, is, they find it quite fascinating. At least it's a good opportunity to to introduce some dependence which is calibrated as a narrative here. Yeah. Um, I have a question uh, from the uh, audience. Um, can you talk about real life applications, um, scenarios? Um, no. Uh, where you, I, would, I you would use this in? Yeah, I, I don't think I can in the sense that I can tell you that where you could use it in principle. I, I don't think that as it is, could be used for real life. Unless you have a very large system, I'm not sure what I should look at. Uh, interacting particles that play a game, I'm not sure. Uh, but if I, if my bet is that if you look in something, so in biology, for example, if you have a huge amount of players, it means a, a huge system of, of whatever object you want to take into account. Uh, this could be of interest, but not as it is with this independence. Is not uh, the is I I don't think I can I I want to try to sell it as it is, uh, it, it, uh, and as I said my my job is to study randomness. But the way um, I would describe the importance of this is the typical game you can find. So the typical behavior of the best response that the typical behavior, the typical number of pure Nash equilibria. So if you see plenty of games are related to each other with the same dimension, if you want, this is the typical scenario you will see. Yeah, so that's, that's how, only, that's how uh, I'm sorry? That's how random games come into game theory, you know, trying to inform game theory in a way, yeah. 
the alternative is to think of the payoff not be, you are not able to measure properly the payoff too or you do not what to, you do not know what the outcome would be maybe lack of information about the outcome but they, then again the assumption that bothers me for applications is that you are assuming that the payoff has this have the same distribution the independence is not really an issue for application i think but what we have to change is the the gap in the distribution. I yeah, think. As always, mathematics deals with toy models, you know, things that help explain, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily immediately applicable. Yeah. <clears throat> um, all right. Uh, are there any other questions, comments? Um, I think that's all. And uh, if there are no further questions or, or answers, I would like to first thank you, Andrea, and uh, maybe you. I'll pass on to Uday, who will take over from here. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that presentation, Andrea and Kai.